Hello, good morning, and welcome back to the Wild Wisdom Wellbeing guest slot with me, Robin Harris of Equenergy Wellbeing Naturally. And today I'm absolutely delighted. I have another wonderful guest. Today I have Claire Elms of Inspire You uh, here to talk about a lot of uh, wide ranging topics around stress, trauma, self care for ourselves, for the families, for children. So uh, I shall hand over now to Claire. If you would introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about you and then uh, about how you set up your business. Sure, thanks Robin. Um, so my name is Claire. I um, I set up um, my business a long time ago, actually, back in 2009. Um, but um, hadn't, um, hadn't promoted it, hadn't done anything, just had a website and people were coming to me and it was just sort of plodding. I was working alongside, so I worked um, I've worked as a social worker and I've worked in the NHS for the last five years. So I've been working um, doing things in adult mental health and in children's mental health support services as well as doing voluntary services. That's all I've had to um, So yeah, so it was quite... Um, right, um, it's a really bad echo. Can you hear that? Is that just my <laughs> every now and again? It just comes in. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. I think it's <laughs> <laughs> Um. Yeah. So um, I set up um back in October nineteen. I decided I was going to rebrand my business last year. Um. Obviously, before we knew anything was going to happen. <laughs> um. And um, started the process in February. And um. Yeah. Just it snowballed really because I think of the current climate was correct with COVID and things and just um having um yeah it just opened a lot more opportunities like bringing everything online and just seeing all the different things that I can do to support people so I've been doing a lot and um, I bought an app so I can um, run some courses um so I'm starting to kind of put the courses in motion so I'm going to be running a sleep course quite soon um, to help people support with their sleep um, and um, getting in quite into kind of organisational support. So over the current lockdown, I've done quite a lot of support with schools and um, they don't have a lot of kind of clinical support or emotional wellbeing support as such. So um, kind of helping them with um, doing different wellbeing webinars and, and looking at kind of difficult cases and supporting their needs as well. And I've been doing some bits within the NHS as well. So it's been keeping me busy. Um, but yeah, so my plan is to leave the NHS in April. So it's all kind of ramping up now. And um, yeah, just um, I pivoted into life coaching as well last year. So that was something that um, I knew about, but hadn't, co hadn't connected how aligned it was and how similar it was to what I was already doing. So I do a lot of um, work with trauma and anxiety and it and a lot of the, the um, life coaching stuff is kind of connected really well within that. Um, hmm. And I'm a qualified play therapist as well. So I support um, children. Um, so I support children uh, through play, like primary age children. And I also do a lot of stuff with teenagers as well. So, yeah. All such... Yeah, such valuable work and so needed at this time. So although you started rebranding and everything in 2019, 2020, and then, whoa, the whole world changed. I think probably that was really a good time in a sense because it was so needed and so much of that sort of work, what we do, it can be offered online. So it doesn't matter that we can't meet in person. Yeah, it was um, it was a very different world, and I think I my mm. plan was I'd set up this group on the app, and my plan was to run a Facebook group alongside it. So I ended up jumping into this like free Facebook group challenge, and um, you and I know what happened from there. It just kind of snowed yeah. into a, a six month business academy course. So um, yeah, so it's um, it's it's interesting how when you set the wheels in motion and you start doing something how many different doors open and different opportunities. Absolutely. It's like saying a big yes to the universe, isn't it? You say, Absolutely. this is what I want, and, and you put your heart and your passion behind it. And all of a sudden, it's like they say, when the student is ready, the master will appear. And you just 
yeah, the universe just says, right, you've asked for this, here you go. <laughs> yeah, it's been really exciting. I think it feels very scary um, to leave the NHS, to leave like security mm. and all of that kind of thing. But, um, you know, I've done quite a lot of work around mindset and um, a lot of sort of inward work around myself. And if it doesn't work, I know there's plenty of jobs in the NHS. I can always go back and, um, you know, so it doesn't feel... And I think it's funny because I I was full-time and then when I went back after having children, I went back three days a week and then I went back two days a week. So I've kind of slowly, slowly kind of gone down there like, no, we will do it at some point. (laughs) And I think it's um, it's a good time now. My kids are a little bit older. They don't... um, still intense because they're still sort of young but they're they're not um they're at the age where I've got the headspace back again which feels nice yeah yeah and because probably you have that foot in the door of the NHS already you have that inside knowledge you know from from experience what the NHS people working in the NHS need what is what are the challenges that they face? Because I volunteer with Frontline Assistance for Stress and Trauma, FAST for short, offering yeah. support to frontline staff, most of which are NHS. And it's very challenging to get into any institution. But yeah. the problem with the NHS side of support is that the waiting lists are so long. Whereas we say that we are FAST, we can uh, usually sort people out, get with a, you know, match them up with a, a professional practitioner within a couple of days. So when you know the systems and you know then what support is required, what people have experienced. And when we talk about trauma, I've been looking into PTSD recently and the different kinds of PTSD that there are, one-off trauma that you might have versus the ongoing so quite often things start in childhood, you might have had childhood trauma, or it can be the ongoing work trauma, and also getting an understanding of what that actually does, how it impacts on our lives, because PTSD isn't just one thing, it's not just what we may- maybe think of, you know, flashbacks or those sorts of things. There are so many aspects to it. I posted something the other day. So you have all of that knowledge and, and all of that arsenal of tools then that you can use to support people. Yeah, and I think it's really interesting that um, so many of us don't perceive that we've experienced trauma. Um, so yeah. quite often when I start talking with people and I ask them about their their past history and, and where things have been for them it's like I suppose even I was like that you know my parents separated when I was 18 oh, it didn't affect me because like you know I was an adult and it, you know you kind of um yeah the, the, the things that you have and, and it's interesting that even like a conversation like maybe like a a parent telling you off or a, a teacher telling you off or something like that can really get stuck in our brain and so I think the more you you understand about trauma and attachment, the more interesting it becomes, and the more you can unravel a whole new load of stuff. And it's 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 sort of really interesting about and um, when you do um. So I, I work um with trauma using something called EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, and it's a fascinating approach. And what um what it does is it takes your mind on a little journey to kind of almost pick up all the all the little traumas that are associated with the main trauma because we don't often think of um you know a lot of these things as being significant but even like covid is a trauma in its own right you know we've we've all lost our routine we've all lost something um quite significant even if that's just having to be at home you know and then you've got the people that have lost loved ones and the people that are working and seeing you know everything from from a front hand sort of perspective so i think it's um it's going to be really interesting how the next kind of year or two kind of pans out with with everything afterwards and when things settle down a bit more how um you know people having that time to reflect on stuff um is really Absolutely. absolutely and i think 
they're finding now that the frontline staff just don't have ta that time at the moment. It's just go, 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 go. They're working such long shifts. They're exhausted. They just go home, try to sleep, come back in and start the whole process again. So there isn't, because we need that time, don't we, to process. It, we go into this freeze and then fight or flight and we're not processing yet. It's only when we can stop and kind of take that step back or rest. And this is why I'm so passionate about why rest is so important, because it's cumulative, isn't it, the stress? So if you're going on and on and on and on and on without stopping, it's just building and building and building. And I think it was really interesting what you... Sorry? I was just going to say, I thought it was really interesting that what you were saying there about we don't recognise trauma in ourselves. We think, oh, it's fine. And we dismiss so much, which... I think is real shame because we have this concept of trauma has to be a huge big thing that everybody would see as trauma but for me trauma is so subjective and if it happened when we were much younger then we need to understand that it impacted on that younger self it was from the perspective of that younger self and we have that younger self inside us still so yeah. it may still be responding so rather than thinking I'm 18 I'm an adult it doesn't affect me I'm still a child where my parents, you know, I still relate to my parents from a child perspective in many ways. So that child is still going to feel hurt that my family has changed so drastically, so dramatically. So it is a trauma. And anything, whatever size, if it affects me and upsets me on a personal subjective level, it's trauma. Whether it would have traumatized anybody else is not the issue. If it's impacted on me, that's the issue. Like school bullying, you know, a lot of people, um, mm -hmm. you know, children are horrible, aren't they? At school, there, there are moments Can where be. children, you know, I would say a good sort of eighty percent of people have had an experience of school bullying at some point. You know, I don't know the full mm -hmm. stats on that, but I would say it's really, really high. Um, and. Um, you know, sometimes those instances can really stick with us and they can kind of go forward and impact on our relationships moving forward. And, you know, it, it has like a real cumulative effect. And, um, you know, it's quite interesting when you start delving, like the, the things that unravel. And it's quite good when you do the work yourself, you realise like, wow, you know, because because I've experienced it, I know how to then help other people go, going through it because, you can see the different pathways. And I think when you're a practitioner and you're experiencing it at the same time, you can see, okay, that's interesting that my mind's going there. And, and it's sort of, it's hard, it's hard not to like stop yourself, but it's also like just trusting the process and trusting that things need to be kind of cleared. So, um, you know, what we do know is that the traumas do get stuck in the wrong part of our brain so they don't get processed. So when we have, um, an experience it, it can trigger a lot of emotion with it because it's stuck in that kind of emotional limbic system rather than um processed in our memory so um it's a really powerful um, thing to explore um, and a lot of people are going through this burnout at the moment you know like so many people were saying to me in january i just i can't do it again i can't do it again when we sort of hit into that lockdown and it's like you know we're all at burnout we're all like kind of We've, none of us have had like proper breaks we're, we're just you know plowing through trying to ignore the fact that it's all going on um just trying to get through it and I think so many people um that I talk to when we talk about self-care and rest they just like yeah yeah I'll get to that at some point and it's and it yeah. is like on the list isn't it so it's just kind of really helping people to kind of bring that higher up and prioritize yeah. that um which can feel really hard when you've got so many different things that you're trying to juggle because it's just we're not superhuman are we we're not meant to we're not designed to teach kids at home and we're not designed to um you know be in this world of trying to work from home and do this and do that it's just it's too many balls I think and lots of people have been really struggling and so much pressure that we put on ourselves the expectations of if I'm teaching at home, my children must still achieve what they would have achieved if they were at school, which yeah. is unrealistic unless you are a teacher or you have trained or, or you know, you have a, a passion for that or whatever. But the average parent might be really, really struggling with that. And the fact as well that we are home based, many of us now, I'm hearing so many people saying it's a real challenge because I don't have 
any definition of I used to have work life and home yeah. life and yeah. I could you know come home and switch off at the end of the day or through the weekend but now my office is actually a corner of the room so it's yeah. still there and it's kind of bugging me all the time because I think oh I could just go check my emails or there was that report that I didn't quite get finished or whatever it might be because we yeah. don't have that distinction and somebody was saying to me the other day that it's like this is my workspace and that you know two steps away is my life my home space so it's yeah. two steps and it's just not enough to make that distinction and that that split of this is my work life and then I leave it behind and yeah. I go home and I think that's, um, I've definitely noticed that with coming online because social media is 24 seven, you know, people, especially when you've got people from like America and Australia and stuff. So I'm having like, you know, like my emails ping at all sorts of days and time, uh, times of the day and night now. And so just like my phone and it's like, I think we do feel a bit of a slave to the phone. So I'm definitely making more effort in, um, you know, so I get all my emails on my phone. I get every, like everything is just so accessible. And then you see it and you're like, oh, I should just buy. And then you realise it's like 10 o'clock at night and you're like, well, what am I doing? Because like that would never have been the case before. So it's definitely something I've been trying to improve on. And I think as well with um, lockdown, you kind of, there's an element of guilt that like, well, you know, I haven't done a full day's work because I've been looking after the kids or because I've been doing this, that and the other. Um, so you then feel like when they've gone to bed, rather than doing something for you and resting, you're like you're still working and it's and it and it gets like it's exhausting isn't it and so I think that's definitely um it's quite interesting actually I've had a conversation and my my dog is really struggling with them um, with the current climate and I think um with me being at home and in the kitchen and literally next to him all the time he's not getting that separation and he had he was this rescue dog and he had a lot of separation issues anyway so I'm not I've got this lovely space um, here in the bottom of my garden it's like my summer house but I haven't felt like I wanted to come here and also with the kids being at home I couldn't come in here as well so I'm trying to juggle so having that space I think is going to be really important I'm going to try and set up a bit of an office space in here I think to kind of help me differentiate between this is my work time this is my home time I think especially with me leaving the NHS I think I need a bit more yeah. of a differentiation so that feels really important and I think you know so many of us you know and I and I feel for people that that are like in studio flats or you know yeah. or in sort of shared accommodation where they're literally they're doing their work in their beds it's impacting on their sleep a lot because what we know is the more active stuff we're doing in our bed then the less likely we are to want to go to sleep when it's bedtime. time um, so that was part of my kind of rationale for doing a sleep course really is that I've just so many people I think everyone I've spoken to is struggling with sleep on some level at the moment and um, that felt like something that was something that I could do to really help people kind of get back on track with, with their sleep so and I think the whole fact that our routine has been disrupted is going to impact on sleep full stop and the yeah. fact that we don't have that distinction this is work life this is home life and they're kind of blending and merging in some weird way means that we don't have the space even just to chill a little bit because I find that really essential if I can't chill before bed I don't sleep so well yeah I need the wind down time so if I don't have that then you know it's all it's a kind of set of dominoes isn't it one thing impacts on another thing impacts on another thing impacts on another and the whole thing yeah. then just kind of falls to pieces you're going into bed and you're like still really wired and um you feel exhausted but you can't your brain yes. won't stop. and I think that's um you know I've, I've always sort of struggled on and off the sleep until I had kids really and then I think the, the fact that you're so sleep deprived you just like just sort of like it's almost conditioning like okay my head's on the pillow go <laughs> you don't know how long yeah. get. <laughs> but um it's definitely I think as well over the last five or six years I've got more into like this world and I think sort of shifting away Um, I was a social worker for a long time and I and I don't think that um there was enough emphasis on um mm -hmm. looking after you know we were going in and talking to people about routines and this and that and blah 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 but actually we weren't um 
we weren't looking after ourselves you know I nearly hit burnout I was working 50 60 hour weeks I was doing stupid stuff and you, and you know I remember speaking to a parent at like 10 11 o'clock at night on the phone and we're both yawning and I was like what I think it kind of was almost like that moment was almost the thing of like what am I doing <laughs> because it was like what well, why am I speaking you know we're not having a productive conversation because we're both tired we're just going around in a circle so you're having like an hour's conversation with someone that's not productive you could probably do in about 15 minutes mm-hmm. so um yeah I think there's just so much we don't um we're not very good are we generally in society at the moment of just stopping and I think COVID has done that for a lot of people you know where people have been furloughed or you know we've had time to be at home the amount of I had Borne referrals since January about career change. <laughs> like people just go in, I don't want to do this job anymore. And um, I think, you know, I think, yeah, I think we've realised either that we don't want to go back to the way that we worked. Maybe home working is actually turning out to be a real benefit, um, and we want to stick with that, or we want to blend our work more. Or we've realised yeah. no one needs an office. It's it's going in different directions for different people, isn't it? And I love the fact that we are so individual. But it's how can we then keep that individuality and not feel that, well, we have to go back to the office if that's not suiting. Or that I want to stay at home. Office doesn't suit me. I, you know, is there an expectation that I will go back to the office? Is there an expectation that seems to be happening in a lot of businesses now that we're going to make you work from home? Yeah. So, so am I then needing to reassess where I am and really feel into does that work for me, or do I need to find another direction and how do I do that? But for me, it's being true as true as we can to ourselves and acknowledging that. It's okay if I want to stay at home. It's okay if I want to go back to the office. It's okay if I'm struggling with uh, homeschooling or with any of the things that anybody is experiencing at the moment because we are all individual and it's going to impact on us in different ways. And just because your co-workers or your family members are reacting differently doesn't mean that the way we're reacting is wrong or odd. It just means that maybe we need to do something that's different from what they're doing. And that's perfectly yeah. okay. When we need different things, don't we? Everybody has a different set of needs and values. And I think um, it's interesting because so many people were saying, you know, like, oh, you seem to be just taking this in your stride. And um, I really was interested in several moments that, um, you know, I don't know how we got through the day. And I think, you know, um, because of what we do, I think people sort of look to you like, oh, you know, you know, you post all these pictures and you do all of this and you do all of that. And it's like, yeah, but, you know, that's a moment in time, isn't it? And I think, you know, um, I love one of my friends on Facebook. He always posts, like, the most true to life kind of posts. And it's just so reassuring as a parent, you know, like, he has this lovely photo of their family. And then two minutes later, he has one of the children crying because they didn't do this or something. And it's just like, it's just... um it's comical and I really like how he kind of portrays it because I think he just gets it spot on and I think so many of us felt the pressure you know I was talking to people that thought that they had to do homeschooling for like three four five six hours a day with these kids and I was like no (laughs) just like do what you can and you know set them other things you know like my daughter would do baking and was quite interested in the scales and like that we do math by working out things in yeah, the yeah. Scales, you know? um, she must like got the uh, little camera for Christmas and so she was going out taking photos and then we'd take the photos and do like a picture and stuff and it was like trying to find things that weren't attached to the screen as well because I think you know the screen can then, can give us like tired eyes and can make us feel worse and I don't know about lots of people's kids and stuff but I know mine if they watch more than an hour or so on the screen that they kind of go a bit their moods like really dip <laughs> so you have to kind of give a really good balance but it's really hard when you're working full time you know like obviously like last summer all these amazing like projects that people were doing with their kids and you're like I'd love to have done that I'd love to have had that time <laughs> but, you know when you're trying to like do your work as well it's really really hard balance and I think people like you said earlier so much high expectations of trying to get everything done 
Um, you know, I've done Gusto and Hello Fresh since January because it's just one less thing that I have to think about. And they, they always give deals and stuff. And I'm like, right, okay, I'll get those on the deal. <laughs> like, I don't mind doing that for a few days a week. It just it just takes the pressure off. Like, mm. I was finding I was getting really stressed about what to cook every day. And I think, you know, so many people I speak to, like, it's just another thing and they end up having a takeaway or like just toast or something because they just can't be bothered to cook anything and I think that that can really feel quite overwhelming when you're sort of worrying about those little things about you know because it becomes a big thing doesn't it and I think yeah. oh absolutely sugar then. and I think yeah we, we put all these unrealistic expectations and I think a lot of them are society or social media, like you say, because we look at these posts and people aren't generally, your friend is a great example of somebody who does, but generally people post the good stuff. They post the happy pictures and we take happy pictures. It was the same when I was a child, you just had, you know, the old camera that you'd have to send the film away and then go to the chemist. And <laughs> I don't know what you're gonna get, yeah. <laughs> Even in those days, you wouldn't you'd be taking the happy family photographs. So it's all come together, smiles, say cheese, you wouldn't be posted picking the moments when the child is crying or having a tantrum or when something has broken you're you're obviously wanting to capture the happy memories so that you can look back on those but then when that goes into social media it looks like that is your life because you know that they, they say now don't they if you didn't take a photograph it didn't happen if you didn't share it on social media it didn't happen so it gives us this really false image of well everybody else is doing this everybody else is doing well everybody else is putting in all of their work hours and homeschooling and cooking because if your kids are at home and you're at home all of a sudden it's three meals a day that you have to provide <laughs> plus all the snacks in between i'm hearing all of these parents yeah. saying, my children when they're at school they have one meal and maybe a couple of small snacks, but now that you're at home, they're just, it's wall to wall food. Yeah. What's going on? It's funny, like my, my daughter's coming up five and she's in reception. And um, for anyone that's, that's, that's had any sessions with me recently will know. That, like, I think part of it's curiosity. She likes to know who I'm talking to. Like she will quite happily sit and watch a film. But if she can hear that I'm talking to someone, she wants to know who it is. So she'll come out and she'll go, me I'm hungry and she'll know that I have to act on that because I'm on, I'm on a call so she's quite clever in that sense and then the other person goes oh isn't she sweet because like, she's coming out and like being all sweet and like mommy um I'm really sorry to change to, to disturb you but <laughs> and I'm like, yeah yeah it's not sweet when she does it all the time <laughs> But, you know, for you, for one caller who only sees it once, it's really sweet. For you, that that's the tenth time that week or day. <laughs> <laughs> she was literally having, I don't even know how many snacks she was having. I mean, like a healthy-ish snacks. It's like fruit and like fruit bars and stuff. So it's not like too much stodge. But yeah, it's just, um, it does make you kind of, um, you know, like I was setting her up with tea on a tray and stuff because because of the work I do, I don't want her to hear a lot of what's being said either. So she's in the lounge, like with her little picnic on a tray <laughs> with all her like tea, while I'm talking to someone in the kitchen about you know how difficult things are for them. And I think you know it's been a really difficult balance, hasn't it? But it's become almost acceptable. You know, I think like if someone had said to me like last year, this is how your your working life would have been, I would have been absolutely mortified. I know when the kids were off and stuff and you know, you're still trying to kind of like do I speak to people or don't I? And and it was just like that kind of mortifying feeling of like, Well, what am I doing? Um, whereas now it's just like it's just acceptable, isn't it? You know, there's so many videos, isn't there, of people doing things and their kids coming in to help and stuff and it's it's I suppose it shows that you're human as well and it shows that um you know that this kind of is, part of you as well so yeah I think it shows that you are human it shows that you have other stuff going on in your life and if you have a client who's struggling with the fact that they're trying to juggle all of these things and they see that yeah this is how life is at the moment it's okay if you're struggling with it it's okay and that you can have that relatable uh, rapport kind of connection and see that in another and I've been on meetings where it's almost been actively encouraged yeah sure let your kids come in let your dogs come in let your cats come in and people yeah. saying it's really lovely 
mean, it's obviously not not a work call as such, but networking yeah. that sort of thing. It's really nice. You get to see what's your home like. <laughs> it's kind of like that through the keyhole. <laughs> it is funny, isn't it? You'd never like. Um, yeah, I'm just really mindful about what the kids are up to. Like my, I've got a two and a half year old in there. We were having a team meeting the other day, and she's like, she she bought the stool from the bathroom in and climbed up onto these breakfast glass stools we've got, which are really high. And she was like, literally climbing up and down, and going, I can do it, I can do it. And I was like, oh my god. <laughs> yeah I think it's um yeah it's been a funny time for people but it, it's just mm -hmm. hopefully the um things are gonna ease off a little bit now the weather's getting better people feel a bit more optimistic and I think hopefully we can get a good run now where there's no school closures, no this, no that, we can get back into normality and, and like you say, yeah, we feel like be forward, forward yeah. from here, no further backward step. Well, at least they're not, but they feel that way, don't they? And particularly when it's portrayed in the media, I saw one man who was saying, we can't go back into lockdown. Maybe we will. <laughs> Maybe we will. We need to we need to share positive or or optimistic um, ways of, of approaching things and support ourselves, do that self-care. You know, if it doesn't, ha if this doesn't happen the way we expect it to or want it to, there are still other ways of doing things and we will get through. So having those, actually, I have XYZ tools at my disposal if it doesn't happen the way that uh, the government are saying, I still have these tools, I still have resilience, I still have strength. And to focus on those and to focus on the things that we can do rather than the things that actually is out of our control. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, think, as I, I know you've been doing the same. I think in my in my group and with a lot of my clients, that's basically what we've been looking at. It's like what can we do? How can we manage? Like, you know, having top tips, having things that we can just like that we can grab and go right okay this is what um this is what i'm going to try and a lot of it is around routine actually and you know um so many of us like just stopped everything and you know like i've have been really lucky like my fitness um community all went online so like i've still had that access to like it hasn't bothered me that the gyms are closed and it's been a bit sad that i can't do things in person but i've still had you know online workouts at set times I've still had on demand that I can like jump in and do stuff if I've got five minutes it gives you that um experience I guess of still looking after your stuff still making that time and um, it's just hard it's just harder like we just have to think a bit more and I think you know um it gets exhausting like like thinking about meals to cook and stuff like that and you don't want to be regimented in like right, I need to know what meals I'm having on, on each day. But sometimes that actually makes things a bit easier. I mean, it's, it's one less thing you need to think about. Um, and I've started doing things like prepping my lunch for the next day, um, like I would if I was going to the office, because it just means that it's one less thing I need to focus on in the daytime, because I find it exhausting. I don't know about you, but um, <laughs> I, I don't do a job on a screen for a reason, <laughs> because it, it's hard work sitting and staring at the screen. And I'm, I miss that social contact with people and and you know none of us are used to looking at ourselves um as much as we have recently. <laughs> um, and um, just having that time away from the screen I think it's really important like um there's so many different things for that now isn't there with the like different approaches where they say you know 25 minutes of screen time five minutes away and stuff and I think there's a lot of sense in that obviously when you're not in a meeting but um there's definite like kind of space to just kind of move away. I did um, a three day training course on Zoom last week and it was exhausting. And it was just like, mm. I, I don't know how much of that I can take. I mean, training courses are tiring anyway, aren't they? So I don't know how much it would be interesting with the research mm. around, you know, how much of that was containable compared to how much of it was containable face to face. But, um, you know, I think. And I'm sure. I'm sure there's been research into the optimum length of time 
to work on a screen, like you were saying, we now have the 25-5. And I know that in some places they're putting that into their meetings to say yeah. that, right, we will take a five minute break after 25 minutes or, you know, when we have a break in the agenda at around that point, we'll take a break. Yeah. And it will be interesting if there's been research that could then come back around to feed into the institutions who are now and maybe in the future will be doing more of these online trainings, online meetings to say your audience will uh, get more actually if you take breaks. It's the same for ourselves and you were talking there about lots of little different things we can put in place to support ourselves and we might think a uh, five minute break is not going to make all that much difference or planning my meals the night before or I had uh, a wonderful woman on here from Kitchen Titbit, Sarah, talking about meal planning. And meal planning in the previous world might not have been an issue, but now it might be a really big way of giving yourself back some time, some headspace. And it might not look like a big thing, but when we actually do it and we are consistent with it, we start to see, I feel so much better. I feel so, I have so much space back in my day. And even if that's just space to breathe, it might not be kind of physical space or it might not seem like very much time, but I just suddenly feel oh, that's a load off. I can breathe again. So yeah, important, it's isn't it? It's also pilot end, isn't it? Because you know what's happening, you know what to do. I, I know um, just before the last lockdown, I, I went through, I was bored of what I was eating because I was just buying the same stuff. You go to Tesco or wherever they eat, you buy the same stuff and you eat the same food and it was just getting boring. And um, I decided I was going to go through all my recipe books and pick out favourite recipes. So what I've done very, very tediously um, is put, you know, chicken dishes together, beef dishes together, veggie dishes together, lunch dishes together. I have like a whole list now from my cookbooks of like what page numbers I like and what things I like. And then when I go to do my shop, it's a bit like a Hello Fresh Gusto. It's like, right, okay, like I'll pick one chicken, one fish, one this, one that. And and I'll buy, you know, three or four meals. But that just takes the prep. It becomes on autopilot then. It's like, right, I know I'm cooking that this week. I don't, I don't have to think about what I'm getting out of the freezer, what I'm doing, what I'm going to buy. It, it just becomes better and it's more economical and it becomes that you're not buying you're not wasting so much food because I was buying loads of stuff going oh yeah I'll do um you know I'll do some roasted veg at some point and then the like aubergines would have been in the freezer in the fridge for too long and you know that sort of thing that we do because like time disappears <laughs> you kind of end up in a yeah. <laughs> just waste you're just wasteful and it's sort of just trying to be mm. more mindful of it without being too rigid on like you know actually I want to have a takeaway tonight or I want to do this tomorrow or you know um and getting the kids involved with it they loved it they loved kind of just choosing different things and like they'll look at the pictures and go oh, yeah I want that one <laughs> and helping I was they just it, yeah. I was just going to say that that ties in with what you were saying before and I think it's a great opportunity we now have this life that is blended our home life and our work life and homeschooling is kind of a bit of a mishmash at the moment. So yes, there are challenges in that and it's good to be aware and honor and address those. But also I think there are great opportunities. I think there's always opportunities within any challenge. And you talked before about, um, was it your daughter helping you with baking and you doing the scales and that's a bit of maths or, and I think that these are kind of real life as opposed to you're in school and you have a book and it says two guys build dig a hole and then a third guy comes along and he digs at this rate and they dig it. Yeah. You know, it, 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 what, what's the point? Will I ever have to do how long it takes to dig a hole and how deep they'll get within a certain time? But I might, when I leave school and leave home, need to cook for myself. And I might need to go to the shop and know how to do money. And there are all of these opportunities that it might not be, um, you know, the, what's on the curriculum as such, what the kid has been set to do that day or that week. But it's still an opportunity for learning. And I love how kids just learn, don't they? They're just sponges. And we can enjoy that with them because we can start to see through their eyes. And then it becomes something that is uplifting for everybody and then when it gets to be a bit right i need a break now that's fine take a break 
yeah it's allowing ourselves to do that i think definitely and i think that like we got into a bit of a rhythm with like you know she have a phonics this time and then we do this and then we do that a bit like a not as regimented as a school day but like a factor in where i can do my meetings and where she can do her time because she still needs me to help her with schoolwork so it's not like you know i guess a lot of people with older kids they can they don't need to be as actively involved so much but even with the older kids it the work's harder so they do like you know i've seen to lots of parents who have had to help them with like getting their head around stuff and it, it, a lot of it's not googleable <laughs> either <laughs> and so, you know it's, it's good after people who haven't done it for like 20 odd years to try and get your head into to start or it's so, different now it's schooling different. is so different now from yeah. you know when those kids parents were at school or my age when i was at school it'd been very very different to what they learn now yeah so it's hard then to step into the role of teacher and also to remember that teachers have had years of training to do what they do <laughs> yeah. as a parent who hasn't had that training to just suddenly <laughs> suddenly without any preparation just be put in that position i think again that's something that we need to really recognize and honor and allow ourselves to I'm yeah. not going to be at the level of the teacher. And children That's do just, what the teacher does, don't they more than they do what their parents are. I can do, do yes. <laughs> <laughs> Added challenge to the whole mix. Plus, when you're at school and you've got all the other children, your peers around you, and the teacher who you know you do what they say, and you're just in that atmosphere. Whereas when you're at home, it's not like us. We're too close to the kitchen, and oh, I'll just go make a cup of coffee, or I'll just put that wash on, or hmm, I'm feeling a bit peckish. Distractions <laughs> are everywhere. Yeah, I think that goes for adults as well, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I was, I wanted as well when you were talking earlier about EMDR. I am fascinated by EMDR, and I was. It's something that I've kind of. It's been on my radar, right on the fringes for some time, yeah. and. I'm fascinated by how it works because I do EFT, Emotional Freedom Technique, which seems to me to be a very similar kind of approach using a different tool. But yeah. EMDR that you could that your eyes, I suppose they're so they're actually nearly a part of your brain, aren't they? They're they're so up there in all of what's going on in your head. Well, what they and link that, it to is with your sleep. So when you're in REM sleep, your eyes move fast yes. side to side so and that's when you process your day so that's um why they do it in that way but what we also know is that because on the screen obviously a lot of people you can't yeah. you can't follow fingers because the fingers go off screen so, um, <laughs> the, the, the tapping shoulder taps we call it a butterfly hug and it's a very similar result and it is obviously putting pressure points on similar to EFT um, but it's the bilateral simulation. It almost doesn't matter if you do this or if you stamp your feet, um, you know, or attach it off the lamp. So many different approaches now are coming in. Um, and even um, there's loads of apps now that you can get. I haven't ventured down the app route yet, but um, there's apps you can get where people plug in like their headset and then you can um, put sounds in different ears. Um, so I haven't done any of those things because I'm I find that the, the um shoulder taps work really well for me. So I'm sort of sticking with that. But um there's loads of different things out there now, which is really interesting. Um and that our body is amazing. Our body is amazing, isn't it? And how much we can work with it to support ourselves and, and all of these things that kind of on the surface find a bit weird and wacky because we're so not used to them and yet when you look into them there is such science to support how they work and I was uh, watching something the other day that was saying if you put your hands up behind your head and you close your eyes or I don't think you even have to close your eyes but just move your eyes from side to side you can feel movement among mm. the, yeah. the, the tissues of the back because it's all linked to your fascia and a lot of our attention can be held in our fascia. So yeah. another kind of support to how things like EMDR work. But I was watching a video as well, which I'll share uh, below, from Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, who wrote The Body Keeps the Score. Yeah. 
Yeah. And he was saying that he used to just think EMDR is a little rubbish. And he would say to his students, don't go down that route. It's a lot of rubbish. It can't possibly work. How can it be scientific? And then yeah. he heard more and more and more about it and he looked into it. And now he is one of the biggest supporters of EMDR. He's, uh, and his, his stuff is amazing. Um, yeah, yeah, I think coach. one of the, um, the trainer, um, I don't forget when she did the training, she, um, she talked about headaches. Now, quite a few people get headaches. And it's something that, like, she she basically said, if you get, like, a really bad headache, if you pick a spot that you need to go quite low down on the wall or, or like, a door frame or something, if you pick a spot and you literally move your eyes really slowly up and down, like, 15 times, it, it clears the headache. And with the screen time and stuff, it's something I've been doing quite a bit because... Like I've always had quite sensitive eyes, and I get I get quite a lot of headaches from looking at the screen too much. And so I take a minute out, and I just go and just like there's a um I've got like a kitchen unit where I've got like um a join in the door, so it's like a a, a straight line, <laughs> and it's it's amazing. Like you can look literally sort of probably knee height, and then go go up as high as you can, and just keep but like not moving your head, so just keeping your head the same and moving your eyes. Um yeah, it helps clear headaches. And it's amazing and it's like really really wacky um how it works and you know but it probably but is something <laughs> because if you think of your eyes moving impacts on your fascia and a lot of headaches particularly that kind of headache are tension headaches yeah and you know we're holding it all up here in the shoulders up the back of the neck across the head so that's probably helping to release that and also uh, eye strain the muscles that work around the eyes, so much going on there. And I did a uh, fascinating um, continuing professional development CPD workshop last September, all about the eye and the eye and how, how we see the world and see ourselves in the world impacts on our well-being. It's such yeah. a profound level, but that's, yeah, that's a whole different subject. But yes, definitely, that's a wonderful technique I think, thank you so much for sharing that, because I think <laughs> headaches are very common at the moment with all the screen time and everything, and the posture. Yeah, you know, you get a headache, and then you, you're, you're struggling, and then you, you squint more, don't you? And then it makes it worse. <laughs> yeah, so it's, 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 um, yeah. yeah, it's definitely so that's, that's a great thing to know. So tell us a little bit more about the work that you do, because I know that you support adults, you support children, you support families. So I suppose like coming online and doing this whole like you need to have like an ideal client. I don't have an ideal client. I like to have lots of different, and I think that's the thing. I've always worked in more than one job, so I like to have different people that I work with doing different things. So um, I do work with children. So I work um, primary age children. I do a lot of play therapy work. So that involves um, them coming into this space, which you can't really see, but um, is um, it's like my playroom. So I have lots of toys out here. I've got sand, um, creative stuff, puppet, um, and they come out here. And the idea is that they can choose what they play with. They play out what's going on. And quite often with um, using specific techniques and tools, you can uh, help them to find resolution. So for children who like may have low self-esteem or like are um you know struggling with parental separation or separation anxiety generally um or just generally kind of feeling a little bit wobbly around different things it can be really beneficial um so I do so that's what I trained in back in 2006 so that's been kind of like my my bag for a long time and um, I support other therapists doing that and support people on the training programs to so I do like supervision for for other therapists doing that um so that's kind of one avenue and then I've also I do a lot of my EMDR with children so where they might have had like a choking accident and then they won't eat food or they've had they've been part of a car accident or maybe a significant like abuse cases where they've had lots of like domestic violence or you know something um like with bullying or something at school and so we can kind of do a lot of sort of really good work with the EMDR doing things like drumming and drawing and different approaches with balls and stuff so it's doing it in a bit more of a creative way and um, so I do that with a lot of the young ones at primary age and then secondary age I do um predominantly like 
CBT and um, solution focused work. So helping children identify where it's, it's been a lot around anxiety at the moment. It's been one of the main things coming out of COVID. So predominantly like supporting young people with anxiety and difficulties around self-esteem, confidence, and just bringing them up. So using things like CBT and NLP. Um, NLP is a neuro linguistic programming. I think most people have heard of CBT, um, but it's cognitive behavior therapy. It's, it's basically looking at how we think oh, we're shifting, shifting our thoughts. Um, so we use that a lot with, with young people. And again, predominantly, are quite, um, it's not quite so structured as talking as like you would with an adult. So again, it's sort of using drawing techniques and things sometimes and bringing different things into the space as and when required so that that's like my work with the kids and then I do sort of family work so sometimes families quite often like parents have different views or there's difficulties with siblings and so you end up with the whole family in doing some work so that can be sort of that side of things and then I do a lot of work with adults um around trauma anxiety emotional regulation so just general emotions that people are struggling with um and um life coach stuff so like i said earlier there's lots of people that would support with careers and um, looking at um lifestyle changes and habit building um and um more recently i've got into organizations as well so i'm doing a lot with organizations and um, so supporting them with um company well-being so doing like well-being workshops and webinars and getting people and um, within different companies to really kind of factor in the importance of, of kind of um you know employee well-being really so um my plan is i've got um, um getting affiliated with um a fitness company so i'll have like a fitness program to run alongside it and i'll go in and offer well-being packages to um companies basically so doing like workshops and webinars once a month and um, support for staff if they need it and um, having things like meditation and uh, stuff they can tap into it's almost like a, a membership type program so I think that kind of covers most stuff <laughs> <laughs> it's it's wonderful all of that stuff and I think it's it's so essential isn't it that we take care of ourselves and I think it's so wonderful that you start at the young kids because when we learn these techniques and ways of I can support myself it's so empowering it's so uplifting and to learn that as a child I wish I had that opportunity because you think you're gonna have those tools forever yeah because once we start to learn how to support ourselves so many parents and adults go into like and they have so much difficulties from their childhood that actually if they'd had mm. something at that earlier intervention mm. time um you know it would have been massive and you know when i was younger at school they didn't uh, no one told me how to manage my emotions or like how to deal with things when i got cross or anxious or stuff it was just mm. like kind of get on with it a little bit so i think you know especially with the current climate so many kids are struggling um you know, kids are resilient and lots of kids have bounced back. And, you know, um, I know my daughter's school yesterday, like, put a note out to say that there was 100% attendance. I don't think they've ever had that with like, every single child. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think lots of kids are resilient and bounce back. But where kids have struggled with things in the past, it can feel really difficult. And, you know, I think it's just, you know, recognising as a parent, supporting them as well and, and recognising mm -hmm how you can help them you know so many parents jump in with stuff at the wrong time and and the child can't hear it because they're in that fight or flight so yeah it's sort of helping people to recognize what techniques work when rather than them going oh no that doesn't work i've tried that <laughs> when you want to yeah, yeah. Been yeah. In at the same time. definitely i think when you're supporting the kids to support the parents is essential it's like if i'm working with animals which is a part of my business that i love it's essential to work with the carer of the animal because then it means that they can go on to do it for themselves as a as a unit and to support a family i don't think there's much better than that you can get than to give that family all the tools they need to move forward as a unit supporting each other and knowing as well because they do this in organizations too particularly i know some residential 
places. I've, I've done some work there and I see how they do it, that the staff tell each other what they need. If I'm having a bad day, this is how best to support me. And the people who live there do the same. So that then they're all working together. They all know what each other needs yeah. at any and one time. Natural, some people need that comfort. Some people need space. So, yeah. it's, you know, and some people need both, but in different times. So it's just recognising. And it's hard to know sometimes, isn't it? Like, you know. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what a lot of us are missing about the office spaces is that space to kind of debrief, you know, if you've had a stressful yeah. morning or a stressful session or something, having that space with a with a colleague just to have a cup of tea and a, and a quick rant is, is what a lot of us are missing at the moment. Um, so kind of factoring that in as well. Yeah, because our emotions are meant to be expressed. They're not meant to be held in. So yeah. that chance gives us the opportunity to process, doesn't it? And then we know what to do. We can find our way forward again. Yeah. Okay. That's been absolutely wonderful chatting with you. And I particularly love that headache, headache uh, <laughs> remedy, <laughs> cure. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you so much for coming and joining us this morning, Claire. And thank you for all that you've shared. So if anybody would like to contact Claire, I will post her uh, website below once this uh, live has finished. And it'll be a little bit later in the day because I'm hopping actually into a next meeting. But thank you so much for joining or for watching on the re on replay. If you are watching on replay, stick in hashtag replay and feel free to make any comments or ask any questions and we will uh, get back to you so thank you everybody and thank you again Claire it's been wonderful having you as a guest thank you for having me bye. it's been good take care bye for now bye